I'll start with a, a photo slideshow. Um, I just want to inspire you. I hope I can. So this is the, the, the city of Dalat in Vietnam. So it's about 1,500 meters. Anybody has been to Vietnam, to Dalat? So this is like their Baguio. This is their high, highland area. 1,500 meters in a plateau. Uh, and, um, and that area is basically, you know, uh, the same latitude as, uh, I think, Coron or, 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 or Boracay. So it's middle latitude, but on a higher elevation, 1,500 meters. They do get typhoon, but not a lot, not like us. So later on, we will explain to you how you can do it and, how, uh, and why we need to uh, know all the weather to grow crops. Now, this mansion is not a rich man's mansion. It's a farmer's house in the lot. Ganyan po kayayaman ang mga magsasaka ng Vietnam, even in Malaysia, the same. So farmer's house, you know, they're quite advanced. I think we are way behind when it comes to innovation in crop production uh, and in um, quality of production of produce. Uh, and we have to catch up. As you can see, uh, in front of their houses, they're doing all the processing, post-harvest handling, which is very crucial for the value chain. The problem sometimes here, in, uh, in, you know, when you produce pinak bet, you just put it in a plastic bag or a carton box, and then you ship it to the market, and then you get a lot of uh, wastage. So you, you, the, the post-harvest handling is also very crucial. Uh, and as you, you can see at the back of the house, that's where they do their rain shelter production. Now, when you say greenhouse production, it should not always be uh, high technology. Okay, it's, it's not about the plastic, or maybe something about, it's not about the amount of investment you put in the facility. It's the trained workers that you have and your know-how to produce that is more important than all the structure that you can. A structure can always be, you know, uh, built depending on the climate using local materials. I'm not gonna push for, you know, to sell you expensive structure which is useless because your people does not know how to use it, for example. No, that's not the case. No, uh, in, in farming, there's, for me, the key is, one is water, okay? Don't put up any farm if you don't have a good water source, bottom line, okay? Otherwise, forget about it. It's not, never gonna grow. Second is a trusty, trained supervisor or agronomist because that's the future of your farm. If you're gonna do this as a weekend farming, as a business, forget it. But if you're just gonna do it as a leisure, okay lang, if you have the money, okay? But if you're seriously going to do production, you have to be there every day. Or at least you have someone you can trust who is trained enough to do it for you on a daily basis. Because this is high value crop. This is not fruit crop that you can just visit every six months, harvest the lanzones, harvest the manga. No, it's not. This is intensive cultivation when you talk about uh, high value crop. So I'm just conditioning your mind. Baka may magba back out na. Okay, okay. So ganun po, no? So this is a comp comparison, no? Uh, this is basically the how how they do uh, production in in Vietnam. Same is in Cameroon Highlands in Malaysia. Same as in uh, in Chiang Mai in Thailand. Um, they're quite uh, the farmers are adapting to you know innovation. We have to, otherwise we're gonna get left behind. Now with the ASEAN integration, the competitiveness of our neighbor, they can easily bring in good quality product to the Philippines. And that will hurt you, that will hurt our farmers. If we don't compete, if we don't have international certification, or if we cannot even justify the pesticide residue level in our produce. So these are the important things that you need to, uh, to learn, no? Um, why I'm showing this is because this is about a few thousand hectares of greenhouse. The total market, the total greenhouse in the Philippines, you know how many hectares? Less than 200 in the whole country. Okay. One grower I went uh, last month in Malaysia, greenhouse grower, he has 300 hectares of greenhouse up in Cameroon Highland. They're building the first 50, they're expanding to 300. Hydroponic and, uh, and, and greenhouse production. 
So that's the difference, no? And uh, we have a, lo uh, a long way to go um, in terms of, uh, yeah, catching up with our neighbors. Like, this is a typical uh, uh, Vietnamese farmer tending her farm. He used to be a grower who's growing lettuce and vegetable in the soil, I, I think about four years ago. So I think three years, uh, somebody taught her how to do hydroponics, so immediately, you know, he, she invested on it, all her savings she put in the system, and then uh, with some technical help from uh, the friends we have in, uh, in Malaysia, she was able to convert everything. But the reason why I want to show you this picture is if you can see what she's holding. Do you know what this is? What is that? A high-tech tablet. <laughs> That's a mosquito swatter. <laughs> you know the battery-powered mosquito swatter? We asked her, why, do you, why, are you, why are you having that? She said, why would I spray? Why would I spray this lettuce? These are eaten raw. Okay? If I have insects there, I'll just get my swatter. Every morning I go in the field. Okay? And kill all the mosquito. Pag Pilipino tinanong nyo, ano pong pang spray dyan? Diba? Yun agad eh. Very practical, very, you know, uh, yeah, you spend one hour a day swatting over the lettuce, uh, you know, uh, plants, kill all the leaf miner, the white fly, the aphids. Why not? Right? Make sense or not? So this is basically, well, this is part of the IPM, you know, because our thinking is, okay, uh, farming, I need chemicals, you know, I need all this fertilizer, I need all this pesticide, you know, in order for, you know, sometimes I would get inquiry from a gardener, home gardener who has a pot of tomato. They will ask, I have worms, what do I do? What, what should I spray? Pick the goddamn worm out, right? So, again, hydroponics in the lot, the structure is not so um, rigid because they don't have much typhoon like us. So they're blessed with the weather. Okay, uh, so they can construct low-cost material. All you need basically is a rain shelter in the tropics. You don't need a close, sophisticated greenhouse with all these nettings and with all this shading and, uh, and other things, you know, because it doesn't work anyway. Insects will still come in. I think you, if you use a 30 or 50 mesh net in your screen, for sure you still have white fly inside, for sure. Why? Because your people are not disciplined enough to quarantine, to close it. They just go in and out without any discipline. So these things, no, these things has to be learned. Uh, we have brought this technology. This is uh, a farm here in uh, Calle Luntian. So these are the group of uh, investors. And show to them that the same lettuce can be grown in the country. The same variety can be grown with the proper technology. It is possible to do it. We did this uh, demonstration with all the new kind of lettuce. I think that was 2015. We invited all our greenhouse grower in this area. By the way, we service majority of the greenhouse grower here. We, s we provide them with the seeds and some other inputs for their... Uh, and the, the greenhouse uh, grower you will see is our client for Mamaya no Mamaya Hapon. So this is what we do. We bring all the growers in one, uh, what we call field day or harvest festival and explain to them the uniqueness of the variety because in your market in high value crop there are different segments you have the a and b and you have the a plus there's a, actually an a plus market in the philippines uh, they're not hard to find they're actually hungry for produce because they're frustrated especially the chef uh, they're frustrated because they could not find what they used to to eat or to to cook in, let's say, Europe or North America, you know. So, but it's possible to be grown in, in the Philippines. You just need to know which variety will go to different market segment. For sure, some of you are growing already high value crops. Uh, some of you might have or are, are already selling what may be called or servicing the B and C or A market already. So, but there are more into it than that. So this morning, we divided the module into three. Uh, the first module is, I, I'd like to introduce to you the high value crop and a little bit uh, preview on the Philippine vegetable value chain. And then uh, some, some tips on investing into greenhouse production, what you need to know. 
And of course, this is a lent this is too lengthy, but I'll try to make it uh, you know uh, more uh, palatable as possible. The the basics of uh, principles of greenhouse production and hydroponics. And then after that, just a quick background on natural farming solution. Uh, what is there? Uh, what is out there in the market that you can use, and how to use them? Basically, the principle of uh, uh, well. You can use this for organic farming or natural farming, farming or conventional farming or IPM. Um, so we'll talk about a little bit about soil health and then crop steering. Uh, crop steering means we we call it maneuvering. Minamani ubra, the crop. You steer the crop to the direction you want them to grow. Okay. You just don't apply fertilizer and then let it be. Okay. You can actually direct the crop. You know, if you want it to have more roots or you want it to grow more leaves, or you want it to convert from growing to flowering, for example. So this can be maneuvered, okay, by either using, you know, uh, conventional uh, nutrition or natural solution. It's available. I have to tell you, I am not a believer of a one single organic product, miracle product for all, solution for all. That doesn't exist. Okay, I'm not a believer of such product. Okay, what you, what you need to know, later on I'll explain to you, is you have to take care of the soil. Put some solutions for the soil, and then steering the, the crop, and then pest management, and then pollination and yield. Okay, these are the system. We call the natural growing system that you need to, uh, to acquire. Okay, so after that, uh, then we will go down to the base, the details of Let's say if you want to go for tomato greenhouse production, uh, bell pepper, a little bit about melon. I think my, our farm manager is here to share that to you. And then for farm tour and troubleshooting, um, the, the greenhouse that you're going later, he is the manufacturer of majority of the greenhouse in the Philippines. And he has his own farm. So if you ask me about, okay, what structure to put, what kind of uh, irrigation system, I may not be able to answer you. That's not my expertise. But if you have those questions, reserve it to Engineer Emmy Show later. Okay, if you have questions on how much it will cost you to build uh, a greenhouse or, or de depending on the system, please reserve it for Emmy Show. Okay? Uh, yeah. So that's basically the module. Uh, now let me start by you know introducing to you. Uh, what the high value crops are. In our own definition, for the Philippines, uh, high value crops are the crops you grow for the A and B market, for, for the hotels and restaurants. Uh, it's also a collection of specialty vegetable which you service on a small amount, a small quantity, but of high value. You know, uh, And some of this, I have to tell you, some of this, I, I think it's here, uh, here. Traditional crops grown in conventional way, which gives you maximum return per kilogram of produce. What do I mean by this? If you are a planter of, let's say, pechay, everybody knows what pechay is, right? You know, the production of pechay in the soil is the same as lettuce. But then again, the price difference is what? 10 kilo per pechay and 100 peso per, uh, 10 peso per pechay and 100 peso per lettuce. Okay, mungo, who's planting mungo here? Mungo. Do you know French beans or filet beans? Or uh, what do you call it uh, in a, uh, yeah, filet beans. No, filet beans, it's like mungo. Very easy to grow. You grow it like mungo, same cultivation method as mungo, same cost, production cost, but you don't sell it for 10 peso per kilo. You sell it for 150 peso per kilo. So these are considered high value. This is basically what we call specialty vegetable. The, the vegetable that you can grow in a conventional method with maximum return, okay? So that's our definition. And then of course the crops grown in greenhouse cultivation, which we'll discuss today, and then of course the organic, uh, organically grown crop. Whether it's, you know, pinakbet, as long as it's organic, the price is high, right? <laughs> so that's basically what we consider high value, okay? But uh, today we would like to focus on, of course, the greenhouse for lettuce, for tomatoes, for peppers, and a little bit about melons if you're interested to, to do it. All right. So there are a lot of lettuce in the world. So anyway, I think this presentation will be given to you as a guide. I'll just explain very quickly 
uh, what are those types available. In, in the lettuce typology, we classify them into heading lettuce and the leafy lettuce. And under the heading lettuce, you have your regular iceberg lettuce, and then you have the romaine. Romaine is considered a heading lettuce unless it's a open, open heart lettuce, uh, open heart romaine. So there's such a thing. And you know, romaine, they, we have the large romaine or large cost. We have the midi or the medium size, the little gem, and then we also have some of the red. Uh, these are all available. It can be sourced out. Butterhead, there, there's a red and green butterhead. It's not very commonly grown in the Philippines, but this, this crop actually commands a very good value. I think the butterhead that is being supplied to Rustans are actually coming past Australia and then price at 400 peso per kilo, things like that, no? It can be grown uh, in the Philippines, in the highland. In the lowland, there might not be a chance. You probably can grow it in the lowland uh, during winter, which is about November, December, January, February, uh, in the lowland, but I don't think the head will be that big, or if it will even form a head. You know, because uh, these are temperature triggered. The heading is temperature triggered. Um, so that's the heading type. And then for the leafy type, we have the regular Batavia red and green, which is the most common. Uh, and then we have the oak leaf red and green, the Lolo, Lolo red and Lolo green, Lolo rosa, Lolo bionda. I think you've heard all red coral or green coral. These are all the same. Uh, and then the new innovations and the new concepts. Uh, right now, you know, uh, the partners we have in Holland have developed uh, a range of uh, new generation of lettuce for the world market. They're at the forefront of uh, breeding for for new new market. Like the Salanova, this is one cup red, one cut ready. It's multi leaf You know, you don't have to chop the lettuce in many pieces. You just chop it once, and then it falls apart in equal proportions. One cut ready. I'll I'll show it to you later on. Uh, and then the Sala Trio, it's a concept where you plant three kinds of lettuce varieties in one pot so that when you cut it and put it in a bag, it's already a mixed salad. You don't have to put individual uh, head of lettuce in a pack. So something like that. These are concepts. Knox lettuce is a new development. Well, it's not, not, not new, but later I'll explain to you what it is. It's basically, you know, when you, when you buy a lettuce salad mix, Sometimes you see browning, right, or pinking. This is basically enzymatic oxidation. So Rixwan developed a variety with delayed browning. Delayed browning means instead of, you know, once you cut in a few hours, it will turn brown. This one will turn brown maybe about two, three days. So in this two, three days difference makes a lot of difference for food processor, for fast food chain. You know, so these are the technologies that are available now. Crunchy cost and burger lettuce. Uh, these are new thick leaf lettuce that you can put in a hot patty without shrinking quickly. Remember when you put a lettuce leaf in a patty, it melts. So now they develop a variety that is thicker, you know, crunchier, you know, that you can put in a burger patty and it will not easily melt. So these are some of the, I'll, I'll, I'll show it to you. Okay, this is the typical iceberg. Everybody knows what an iceberg lettuce is? Okay, I'm not gonna explain much. Um, but mostly iceberg is grown in the highland. There are one or two heat tolerant varieties of iceberg that can be grown in the lowland. Uh, but the heading formation is not 100%. Okay, so these are the things that you, you should know. So this is hydroponically grown iceberg. This is in Cameroon Highland in Malaysia uh, three weeks ago. This is what I'm telling you, this, this company is producing, is expanding to 300 hectares of uh, hydroponic. And this is basically how clean it is. On top, of the, on, on top of the channels, you just cut and then you pack and then ship. So you take care of the logistic. So there's not much wasted. And one head would be about 500 grams, 600 grams per head. They're at about 1,500 meters in Cameroon Highland. So yeah. So that's, that's convenient, and then you get 100% survival. So the way, you know, um, greenhouse production is what I would say, uh, uh, how do you call it, measurable uh, business. You know, because everything you can measure, everything you can quantify. We don't work uh, yield per hectare 
in greenhouse. We work with yield per plant or yield per square meter. Okay, you have to remember those words because in open field farming, farmer A might have one hectare of tomato and getting 10 tons of crop, while farmer B is getting you know, 12 tons or 15 tons of tomato in the same one hectare. And the difference is sometimes they have the higher density planting compared to the other one, right? So there's no standard. You know, the farmer just plant them whenever they want, how many spacing they want. So I don't believe in yield per hectare. I always believe on yield per plant because that's more important. When you come up with your target, you must know how many plants you plant in your area and what's your potential or what's your benchmark yield. For example, if I have three kilo of tomato per plant and I have 10,000 plants, then I would expect 30 tons, okay? So if I do my rounds and go to the field and inspect the field and I count the number of cluster, we do that, you have to count. Count the number of cluster, you must know the number of fruit per cluster. If I see 10 cluster and I see every cluster there's five fruit, so that's 50 fruits. And if one fruit is 50 grams times 50 fruits, that's 2.5 kilo, isn't it? So then more or less I will know, oh, I will earn money because my benchmark is three kilo. And this is just the first fruit set. I'm not talking about the flower that are forming on the other, you know, on top. You see what I mean? Yeah. So as a business, you have to do this, okay? Farming is a business. It's not a hobby unless you want it to make a hobby, you know? But if you want to venture into this, everything has to be measurable, okay? You have to know. Whenever you use a variety, you have to know. You have to ask the technical people from the company, anong yield per plant nito? Anong expected ko dito sa variety? So then you, would, uh, you can easily yeah, calculate. So romaine, this is the large romaine, like I said. Everything is measurable. It's 45 to 50 days in maturity after transplanting. You expect about 800 grams to a kilo per plant. Per plant. So if you have 10 plants per square meter, then you're looking at, you know, 10 kilo. And then if you sell it for, let's say, 50 peso at 10, that's 500 per square. So that's the amount of gross that you should expect. Provided that you have the right variety, you have the right cultivation, you have the right climate. Because this romaine, if you plant it at 1,500 meters, then expect that kind of yield. But if you're at zero elevation, or maybe Tagaytay elevation, then that's totally different story. Later on, I will show you, okay? So this is the large cost. Uh, next one is the, what we call the midi, midi cost or midi romaine. These are the medium size one. That's about 40, 45 days in maturity, you know, 450 gram to 500 gram in uh, average weight. And it forms a heart. I think this is the typical romaine that you see in the salad bars nowadays, Caesar salad, for example. Why? Because they like this because of the head and the core. The, the, they call it the heart of romaine. You know, it's crunchy and thick. So, and there are varieties for indoor. There are also varieties for outdoor. And then what's important is that they have the tendency to twist. I'm not sure if you have planted any romaine before, but some of the varieties twist. It does, it's not good because once it twists, it doesn't form a head. And you want the head. You want the yellow interior. You don't want a green romaine because the market demands for heart of romaine, for example. So we can go down on a smaller one to a mini romaine or what we call the little gem type, which is very compact. It's about, yeah, about 250, 300 grams only at 1,000, 1,500 meters. Uh, so you have the red, red gem and the green one. So in, in Europe, you know, they serve this, you know, they just serve it whole. You know, they just cut the root, serve it in a plate as a whole head, and then, you know, the people just eat it, slice it and eat it. So because it's quite small, you know, and it's uh, so crunchy and sweet. That's how it looks like in the growing system in hydroponics. So it's really small. Um, the colors, uh, I'll explain to you about that maybe later on. Maybe you have some questions about redness of uh, lettuce. Okay, next type is a butterhead. So the reason why it's called butterhead is, is because of its like buttery texture in the leaf. Um, it's a heading type also, so you have the red butter and the green butter. 
Uh, there are varieties for hydroponics. There are varieties for outdoor. But again, in order for you to have this kind of weight and head, it has to be cool. So now you will ask me, this is, we are not in the highland. How can we plant? Right? It's like I'm discouraging you to plant because I will never get this kind of quality. Right? So, but there's a compromise. Maybe later on I'll tell you. you, know? uh, it, you just have to work. Dep like I said, depending on your segmentation of market. If you're targeting A, A+, plus, then they, this kind of quality they will prefer. But B, C, they can do away with the uh, mid-elevation produce or low-elevation produce. Okay, there's a way okay, to, to uh, compensate for that. So, and then we talk about Lolo, the, the coral, the Lolo Rosa, the red one, and then the Lolo Bionda. Okay, these are very frilled, coral-shaped lettuce. Uh, that's why they call them red coral or green coral. In the Philippines, they call it Lolo Rosa. Uh, so, and in the red Lolo, there are actually three colors, sometimes five. <laughs> so depending on how they, the, the breeder uh, interpret it. So the standard red Lolo Rosa is actually green leaf at the bottom with red tip or pink tip sometimes. So, and then we have the double red. The double red is deeper in color and then you have the triple red. The triple red is red all throughout. From the bottom to the top of the leaf, it's dark red, dark maroon in color. Like for example, this is more or less a double red because you can still see green, but the, the intensity of the red is already uh, there. So it's a double red variety. So, and then you have the oak leaf. The oak leaf are, um, okay, before I go any further, the main lettuce in the Philippines is basically iceberg, romaine, and then they have what they call green ice, which is actually a batavia or green rapid type or grand rapid type, and then you have the red leaf. Those are the four main lettuce being marketed. Uh, there's a little butterhead market. Well, it's the market is there, but nobody's producing. Uh, and then there's a... a, a a market also for oak leaf. So the oak leaf, it comes in red and green. Um, the reason why it's called oak leaf is because the leaf is shaped of an, of an oak leaf. Make sense? And then you have the Batavia. So Batavia this is divided into many types. You have the Grand Rapid or what they call in the market. I think you, you hear this term, green eyes, no? Have you heard about green eyes? Green eyes is a Philippine word. <laughs> I never heard it anywhere else, only in the Philippines. They call this Batavia lettuce green eyes. But if you talk about green eyes, when you go abroad, they will never know what it is. But if you say Grand Rapid, then they would understand you. I need a Grand Rapid lettuce or a green Batavia. Okay? So, because Grand Rapid uh, is a type. All right? Uh, it's green to light green leaves. No, it's very, it's very fast growing. Uh, and the disadvantage, because it's fast growing, it's also fast bolting. You know what? The bolting is in lettuce. Ito po yung nagkakatangkay, humahaba. It's actually a sign of flowering. So bolting, we don't want it, right? Especially in the lowland. You don't like stems of lettuce. You want the leaves. You sell the leaves, not the stem. Okay, so uh, the fast-growing green uh, batavia is actually also um, susceptible to bolting. But there are already existing bolt-tolerant varieties around that you can use, okay? This is another type of Batavia. It's called Freelis. Uh, it's serrated leaf. It's very crunchy. It, it's thick, and it weighs more than the regular uh, Grand Rapid type. So sometimes it looks scary <laughs> for other people because they say, oh, I might, uh, you know, cut my throat with that kind of uh, serration. So, but it's not. It's still crunchy. Uh, the only advantage of this is the weight. No, and the crunchiness. And it's normally more green than the regular light green, leafy, uh, Grand Rapid. We like it a lot because it's crunchier. You know, we don't actually like Grand Rapid because it's so soft. Once you harvest, after a couple of hours, it's already wilted, right? So then you must establish a cooling uh, chain. So some, some notes on, uh, on leaf, lettuce. Um, they are greatly affected by heat and temperature because they are not tropical crop. These are actually temperate crops that we're trying to grow 
under tropical climate. So that's why they're very sensitive to heat and temperature. Uh, and they react greatly to low light, like now. You have cloudy days. If you get about one, two, three days or four days of cloud cloudiness, your red lettuce will turn green. And then your small lettuce will shoot out. It will bolt because of low light. All right? Because lettuce is sun-loving, 100% sun-loving. If you put it on a shade, it will be lanky and creepy. It will crawl because it's looking for the sun. Okay, so same as with this. When you get low light like this, then you lose your yield. In our experience, um, in the rainy season, like now, you lose about 30 to 40% of your production. 